so glad that everybody's here today. And we are in part two, really, uh, finishing up this chapter. Last week we saw that we were uh, that we seek God in our prayers, and, and and so that was in doing so that that we, when we seek Him in, in our in our prayers, that that we know that He gives us our answers and, and, and things that we need to do. So today. We're going to be talking about how God answered Daniel's prayers. And, and I entitled it God's answers to our prayers. And But we're going to see uh, in this, but not only are we going to see the answer, but man, just a prophecy that, that was given to Daniel through this answered prayer of him seeking for for uh, forgiveness and restoration of, of, of the Israelites, of the Jewish people. And so we are in Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. And it's God's answers to our prayers. And if you will, please stand as I read God's word. <laughs> Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 20, says, Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God on behalf of the holy mountain of God, while I was speaking in prayer to the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction to talk with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been free for the people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issue of, of a decree to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the sixty-two weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and sanctuary, and its end will come with the flood, even to the end there will be war, desolations that are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings, and on that wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even into a, a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Please pray with me. Lord Heavenly Father, I just, once again, I'm just so grateful to be here to worship you today and just so thankful for everything that you have done for each and every single one of us here. And Lord, I pray now as we come to the time of this message, Lord, I pray that you give us understanding and wisdom, that you uh, help us to understand what, what is spoken here, and Lord, that I can get out of your way and that your words will be spoken. God, thank you for everything that you do. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, you know, for most of us here, we remember who Johnny Carson is. He was the king uh, of, of, of television of the late night broadcasting shows. I mean, uh, for most, uh, there's going to be three or four who might not who know Johnny Carson. But he, all the different things that, that he would do. One of my favorite skits was Karnak. You know, uh, and how he would put that turban on, right? And he would hold that envelope up up to his hand. You know, he became this great mentalist, and, and he would and he would hold that up, and he would make a statement about what was in that envelope. You know, and you know, just for instance, he would he would hold that thing up there and, and, and think about it, and he would say something like Gatorade, and every man would open the envelope, and it would say, "What well, allegations get?" on what well, crocodiles get on welfare, you know, Gatorade, right? And, and then, then maybe he would hold that up here to him and he would say, the Bible Belt. And every man would open it up and it would say, what holds up Oral Roberts' pants? You know, most of them were lame, you know, but I, me being who I am, I would laugh at most of them, right? He, he you know, because I would think that stuff is funny, you know? But what most people don't realize is that people legitimately sent in questions to him so he could answer. That Karnak, the Magnificent, 
could answer their questions. Because they thought it was real. And people thought that he could actually do that. I, I believe that, that things are much different today. I, I think that people have questions. They want answers. I mean, you know, you, you still hear about the psyche network or the psyche hotline where people call in to, to get an answer for, for something in their life and, and the answers they get are probably just as lame as, as Christ the Magnificent would give to other people. And even as Christians, we want answers to our questions. When we, when we go to God, we, we want answers. But you know what? We do have someone who can answer our questions. Well, like God will answer our questions. He himself <laughs> says in Jeremiah 33, he says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. You know, that, that's known as the, the, the Christian, or uh, God's phone number, Jeremiah 33, 3. Yep. You know, call unto me and I will give you answers. And so we, we see that, that we are taught that God does answer our prayers. You know, in Matthew, Matthew, he, uh, it says, ask and you will receive. You know, in James it says, the forever prayer of a righteous man avails much. And, and, so it's, and, and so when we hear these statements about prayer, you know, we still give up a lot of times in prayer. There's that spouse who prayed for their marriage and, and, the, and, and their significant other hasn't changed, so they stop praying. I wonder if there is a God. Or how about the child who no longer believes in God because they didn't get the 10-speed bike they prayed for? Or how about the teenager who's mad at God because God didn't answer their prayers by sending them a, the boyfriend or girlfriend that they wanted? Or God didn't stop their parents from getting a divorce? Or, or, or God didn't give them the answers for their biology test that was coming up, you know? Or how about the single mom who doesn't pray anymore because for two years uh, of wanting a companion... God still hasn't sent one in. Or what about the guy who's angry with God because he prayed for God to, to, to maybe help him with his job and get him a raise, but ended up being let go. And so there are people out there who, who, who quit praying to God because God didn't answer the prayers the way they wanted to or just didn't answer them. But the Bible clearly promises that God will answer our prayers. Matthew 21, 22 says, whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive, you know, with faith. That, 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 that word right there, with faith, means a lot. It just doesn't mean that we can pray and God is some genie that magically gives us our prayers. So the question is, why doesn't God answer the prayers that we pray? Why doesn't God automatically give us a, a yes if we faithfully come to him? I mean, really, if God just answered all the prayers, wouldn't that improve the standing with the community out there? But I believe that if God answered all our prayers, that there would be nothing but total chaos in this world. Amen. You know, so so we have to believe that God answered prayers. I mean, I think that, that as a Christian, that that's something that we need to believe that God answered prayers. And, but how many times have we given up on prayer? How many times have we grown weary in prayer because we didn't see the results that we desired quick enough? Each one of us are in need of answers to prayers. You know? Each one of us is seeking the wisdom to make right decisions in our life. Whatever it is, God has an answer for you. Because why? Our God is an awesome God. He's, omni, he's omnipotent. He, he's everywhere at all times. He, 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 he can do anything that he wants to do. He has that strength, the ability to do that. You know? And God's promise to answer our prayer doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to give us the answer that corresponds to every detail in, in our request. Just because we pray, you know, and we don't get the answer that we want doesn't mean that God does not answer our prayers. And that might come to a surprise of you that, 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 that God answers maybe something besides what you want. I've, I've read this quote. It says, God in his giving is wiser than we are in our asking. Amen. Let me read that again. God in his giving is wiser than we are in our asking. Man, that's, that's a 
that's a great statement. I, I, I read that statement. I'm like, man, that's, that's dead on because sometimes in my asking my prayers, I want things a certain way, but God sees this big picture. And, and he knows everything that's going on. And his answer, his answer might be different than what I want. And, and, and really, uh, and, and to, to give away my four points that I'm having today, that, that God's answer might be no, it might be slow, it might be grow, and it might be go. So, so sometimes his answers are different than what we want. Besides, yes, God's answer uh, of a yes uh, of what we pray is what we want. But sometimes God just answers differently. So we're going to see that a little bit later. But we're going to dig into the scripture right now. We're going to talk a little bit about this vision. And, and, and you're going to have to give me a, a few more minutes because there's a lot to unpack. Amen. There's a lot to unpack. You think, well, Greg, it's only, only eight verses. <laughs> but there's a lot to unpack in these eight verses. So in the first four verses here, 20 through 23, it says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, to, then the man Gabriel, who had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. So God answered Daniel's prayer immediately. God loved his prophet Daniel, and he loved it is people who truly follow him. And he answers Daniel's prayer preferably for forgiveness and restoration. And God gives him an astonished uh, prophecy as we're going to see um, in, in verses 24 on through. God is really revealing, revealing Daniel, his plan for Israel. He's revealing, revealing, revealing Daniel, God's plan for humans, for the human race also. Just not for the Israelites. And Gabriel actually interrupted Daniel's prayer. And he comes in and, and he interrupts this, this prayer. And, and, and the timing, when it says the evening offering, that, that's significant because the evening offering meant sacrifices, meant to bring sacrifices on the evening offering to, to the priest. And, and so this is really pointing to Christ, the anointed Messiah. The one who, 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 who covers our sins. It, it's really important that, 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 that we understand that, that this request by Daniel was for, for God to forgive the sins. And the only way that can happen is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. God does not forgive sins any other way except through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. The only way that we can approach God and ask for forgiveness is through that sacrificial death of Christ, through His blood that was shed on that cross. Because there has to be a blood offering for your sins. That's the way it was set up in the Old Testament for the atonement was to bring a, 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 a perfect sacrifice. A lamb, a, a, a goat, a bull, whatever it was that was called for that. And the priests were offered that sacrifice for atonement of your sins, that blood. So there has to be a blood covering for your sins. And Jesus Christ is that sacrifice for us. Perfect sacrifice. Walked this earth and went to the cross. And, and that's, what, that's why it was so important that he says that evening sacrifice, that evening offering. And Gabriel informed Daniel here uh, of several things. First, he, he said that he was sent to Daniel to give him insight to God's plan for the future of the Jews and the human race. And he declared that, that the prophet's uh, prayer had been heard. <coughs> and the request was granted. As, as, as a matter of fact, it says there in verse 23, at the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued. At the very beginning of Daniel's prayer, God heard him and sent Gabriel to him. From the very beginning, he, he said that, I know your heart, and, and here I, I have sent Gabriel to you. And, and answer it. And he said, Daniel, you need to listen to what I have to say. You need to listen closely so you can understand the vision. This whole prayer started because Daniel had special insight and understanding that regarded his people. 
But he just didn't have it because he was Daniel. He did it because he, he studied God's Word. He, he had the special insight and, and wisdom because, because of the prayer life that he had with God. It wasn't something that was just given to him. I mean, he, he went to God's Word. He, he had a prayer life. And I believe that, that if we want to have insight and understanding in, in our life, and we need to have a prayer life, a, a relationship with God. We need to be studying God's Word. I, I think when we do those two things, that, that God gives us a, a wisdom, a godly wisdom, because we are implanting our thoughts with God's thoughts and His desires. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritually appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we... We see that through the Spirit that we can that we can have a prayer life, that we can get understanding and discernment for, for God's Word. So we go forward. And verse 24 kind of stands out by himself. God gives a six-fold plan for the people of Israel. And, and it says, Seventy weeks have decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. So God really lays out this plan. And, and my Bible says 70 weeks, and there's other, there's a lot of other Bible translations that says 70 weeks. The most says 77. 77. Sevens. Okay? Which means 490 years. That's the Hebrew, what's going on. It's 77. It's 490 years is what, the, is what they're saying. Uh, commentators, which are much smarter than myself, okay, because I don't understand this stuff. So I read commentaries and, and other, other, other theologians to try to figure out what they know and discern from them. You know, it says that this verse concerns the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to offer salvation. For the human race. And it spells out six works that are listed. So looking back in history in the time of Daniel and the time of Christ, we know that it was centuries between those two time periods. That it just didn't happen in a week. So so days or weeks, there was not clear enough time for the events to take place from verses 24 to 27. So so it's just not 49 weeks, it's 490 years. Okay, so that's what that refers to. So we understand it's 490 years. And God is informing Daniel that he has this, this wonderful plan for the Israelites, which includes salvation for the human race as well. And some of these predictions have, have fully um, been fulfilled. Some have been partially fulfilled, and some haven't been fulfilled at all. Um, and so, and so we, we, we see that in, in these uh, prophecies that, that's coming up. So the first part of God's plan here, there's a six-part plan. The first part, as you see here, is the plan or rebellion of the Jews. And there's going to become a time when, when the Jews no longer rebel against God. And that day will come when Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom on, on this earth. So we, we know that, that they won't rebel against them. And the second part is kind of the same thing, that God's plan to end sin on this earth. We know that, 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 we're, going to, that we're sinners and that we're going to sin, and that that sin will end once again when Christ comes to return to set up his kingdom on this earth. So, so all, all transgressions and rebellion against God is going to stop, and all the sin is going to stop when, when, when Christ returns. And the third part of God's plan is the atonement for all the wickedness. Um, to make a reconciliation between God and man possible. Um, and that's going to happen at the atonement of Jesus Christ that he secured upon the cross. 
That's when he became our mediator, a way to get back to Christ. To, 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 that, that bridge of being 100% man, 100% God, and giving us a way to get back to God. It's only through the atonement of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. True. So the fourth part of God's plan is to establish a righteousness on earth. And, and everlasting righteousness is what it is what it says there in verse 24. Uh, and that's when a, a day is coming when the world is going to be full of righteousness. Once again, that's when Christ returns. Set his kingdom. The fifth part of all uh, uh, of God's plan is to fulfill all of his prophecy. At the climax, when all of God's promises and, and visions will be filled, Christ will return. At that point, when all the prophecies of the Bible, when all of God's words and all the visions are fulfilled, at that point in time, Christ will return. So, so we're going to see that. And then the last part was the anointing of the most holy. And that can either mean the anointing of, of, of Jesus Christ or the anointing of the holy temple, uh, of the future temple that's going to be built for the millennial reign of Christ on earth. So that was God's six-point plan there in verse 24. And it includes the Israelites, the Jewish people, and it includes um, the salvation for the human race. But God will fulfill his plan for both Israel and the rest of the world down to the very last detail. Everything in the Bible will come true. Every prophecy, every promise. Matthew 5, 18 says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So we, we see that, that all this is going to be accomplished. So we get in verses 25 through 27, and it breaks down the period um, just a little bit more. It starts at verse 25, it says, So that you know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again in the plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who has come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with the flood, even to the end. There will be war, desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will, be put, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decree is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So, this 490 years is divided into three different periods. The first period is God's plan is seven sevens or 49 years. It will start at the decree of the rebuild of Jerusalem and it will end at the completion of the capital city. So it's going to take 49 years from the very first time they go to Jerusalem to they finish it and rebuild that capital city. God is revealing that the Jews will be set free from the Babylonian captivity and will return home and rebuild their nation and even their beloved city, Jerusalem. So the second period of God's plan was 77 plus 62 weeks, which equals 423 years. And so this is the starting point of the same of the decree of the build of the Jerusalem, the rebuild of, of the Israel nation and, and the capital there in Jerusalem. But it will end at the at, at, at the return of, or that it will come at when Christ comes and goes to the cross. Um, that's um, because it's really saying that there's two things. That, that it's going to happen. The first is going to be that Christ will come and that he will be cut off or, or the death of Messiah on the cross. And so that, that's when it will end there almost 423 years after that. Um, with Christ going to the cross, it, it referenced that, that he will not die for himself, but he will die for the, for the rest of the world. He, he's, not taking, he's not going to the cross for himself, but he will go to the cross for the sins of everybody else. And then we see that the Romans will destroy the temple and that centuries of war, of desolation, will take place on the world, on this earth, right until the time that Christ returns. And the last one, the third period of God's plan is seven. 
which equals seven years. And, and this third period of God's plan will complete his purpose for the world. These seven years will be a time of terrifying tribulation. You know, uh, of these seven years. You know, now, now there's people who think there's going to be pre-trib, that we're going to be caught up before that, mid-trib, that we're going to be caught up in the middle, because the first three and a half years is supposed to be good, and then that covenant is going to be broken by the Antichrist, and he's going to turn, and then the last three and a half years of rule is going to be just a terrifying tribulation, and then at the end of that seven years, going to be all, we're going to be all caught up, you know? There's, there's, it backs up all three. I'm not up here saying which one I believe or which one you don't. You have to, you know, kind of research that for yourself. That's, that's going to be, that's going to happen. But run in parallel with these false messiahs and the lawlessness that, that's going to be happening in the world, it's going to be the body of our church. That's, we're, we're going to be there fighting against this Antichrist. Because we're going to make a stand. And it's going to be hard. But God promises that he will always be with us. That the last day of human history will bring a, a, a period of this severe trial, tribulation, and horrible suffering. But, but God knows that people are going to be persecuted, but God will always be there. He will always stand by us. He is not going to leave us. And he'll give us the strength to overcome anything. I want us to see that God answered Daniel's prayer in a mighty way. I mean, man, he, he, he answered Daniel's prayer immediately. And he showed Daniel this prophecy of what's going to come in the future. And I can't think that Daniel's heart didn't jump for joy in this vision of understanding uh, of, of how his people were going to be brought out of that captivity. How, how, how he was going to send them aside for all everybody else to, to, for salvation of the world. You know what? God will answer our prayers too. Amen. But not always like he did with Daniel. I mean, he answered Daniel's prayer immediately. But God will not always answer yes. We can't treat him as some genie that that we that we just think that we can just wave a magic wand or or, or, or give him a prayer request and he's going to answer. He's not some vending machine that we can put some quarters in and punch a button and, and he's going to just answer our prayers. But God answers every one of our prayers, and, and so I'm going to look at our points here and some and figure and, and, and tell us talk about how God does sometimes answer prayers because sometimes God answers no. Amen. No matter how well intentioned or appropriate our request may be, God's answer may be no. Being a child of God does not guarantee your answer will be yes. Sometimes God answers no just because it is wrong. You know, on Christ's transfiguration, right, when, 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 when James and John and Peter went with Christ on to the top of the mountain, Jesus' deity was shown Amen. to these three guys. I mean, it, it, the, the glory of God shone upon Christ. And his deity was was opened up, and it, it was it was shown to these these three these three people. And and, and I want us to see uh, Peter's request, right? I mean, Elijah and Moses appear with Christ right there on top of that mountain, and and, and Peter. And, and Peter says, says, Lord, if it's good for us to be here, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know, Peter just works that out. You know, man, I, 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 I'm, I'm seeing this. We can make these three tabernacles right here for, for, to, to show the world. And while he was still speaking, it says in verse 5, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I mean, out of that cloud, God says, no. No, you, you don't. You, that, that's not going to happen. We don't want that. My plan, if that's not my plan. Not, I, that my plan will not be fulfilled if, if you just sit here and, and put, put, build these tabernacles. That's not going to happen. My plan will not be fulfilled. Prayers request was misguided. It was motivated by a selfish desire to maintain this word from home for himself. What he failed to realize that, that this would not fulfill God's plan. 
Just, 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 just the flip of that, not, not too far down in there on, in, in chapter 17, we see a demonic boy that cannot be healed by the disciples. That demonic boy, if Christ never came back down that mountain, would have never been healed. We, we, we look at that in verse 14, it says, when they came to the crowd, a man came to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought you, brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus said, you unbelieving, perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. But not only that, can you imagine Jesus stayed on that mountaintop and, and, and that request was granted to Peter that, that he would not have went to the cross. We would not even know the, the grace and mercy for God has given us and we would never have a way back to, to, to God. So, so the answer to Peter was no because it was misguided. But I want to understand something else. Sometimes God answered no. Because he loves us too much to say yes. Amen. You know, we get to Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And James and John come to, come, to, come to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And, and Jesus says, well, What is it that you want? They says, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. They, they, they had no idea what they were, they were talking about. They wanted to share in the, in the little bit of limelight and the power that the prestige of Jesus' coming kingdom was going to give them. And they were devoted disciples of Jesus. They probably felt that they were deserving to have their request fulfilled. They labored beside him. They'd given up a lot to be with him. And Jesus' answer was, no. Because you do not know what you're asking for. He, he says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized? with the baptism or suffering that I'm going to be baptized with, so I'm, I'm telling you no. I love you too much for you to have to fulfill this request. Maybe you're praying and there's a prayer on your heart today that you're trying to, that you're looking up to Jesus. And maybe you haven't received the answer that you want to hear, but maybe Jesus is just saying, no, I love you. I'm protecting you by answering no. See, prayers don't have to be misguided or wrong or selfish to receive a no from God. Maybe saying no because the alternative to answering yes is far worse than what you think it is. Amen. Because that yes might be a job that you're wanting that's going to take away from your family. It might not be the job that you need. Amen. Maybe it's a material thing that you ask for, but that <coughs> he knows that you'll worship that more than you worship him. And you're, and you're, and you're coming to spiritual poverty. Maybe it's a boyfriend or girlfriend that he's saying, no, but that, but that person is not who you need to be with. That's not who I want you to be with your life. Maybe it's a, a, a group of friends that you so much want to break into and be a part of. And God says, you don't need to be a part of that friend. Those, that, that friend group, they're going to lead you in the wrong direction and, and, and get you into things that you don't want to get into. Maybe, maybe it's a no over your school that you want to get into. Maybe it's a, a, it's a no on, 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 on a health issue. Yep. God is in control. And he doesn't always answer yes. But I believe that he answers no a lot of times because he loves us and he cares for us and he sees the big picture wants us to be in a certain spot. And he knows that we can never get there if he answers yes. The second thing I want us to see, sometimes God's answer is slow. Slow. Maybe he, he, he answers slow. Because we live in a fast-paced world, don't we? Man, well, man we, we speed down the, 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 the express lanes on the highway. You know, we get in the supermarket. But man, we want to get in and out we, the best we can. Man, we want to Everything done instantly. Amen. It's a microwave world. Man, we drive up to, to a microphone on a 4x5 menu, and we order our food to the drive-thru so we can get to our, our kids' event, to church, to, to a sporting event, or whatever we're in a hurry to get to because 
We don't have time to slow down. We we got to go, go, go. We got to get there. We got to get there. You know. And our life is the same way. Can't wait till I turn 16 so I can get my driver's license. Can't wait till I turn 18 so I can start voting. Can't wait till I turn 21 and so maybe I can go hang out with the buddies at the bar. Or and then we start. I can't wait till I'm this age. And you know, man, I can't wait till I'm this age or I have kids. And we just hurry through our life. Then we turn around and we're gonna be like Russ, retirement soon, right? <laughs> Or Dennis, who got to retire a few years ago, and we look back at our life and we think, I wish I would just slow down just a little bit more. I wish I would have stopped just a little bit longer. It's unfortunate that this impatience has really found the way into the house. Because we're really impatient about things as Christians. I think we've lost our ability to wait upon God to allow him to more in our midst to do what he wants. I think that we try to circumvent him a lot to try to get things done. It is possible that our impatient desires for an instant answer and that we really forfeit the lesson that, that comes with this process of waiting. Waiting for God's wisdom. Waiting for God's timing. Waiting for God's plan to unfold. Delay is not denial. Amen. Do we realize that God, he has reasons for encouraging us to wait? We're being slow to answer our prayers. And God, God wants us to get the answer right. He does not want us to circumvent anything. Man, waiting builds patience into our character, causing us to trust God more when we, when we have to wait. Process is as important as the product. You know, in, in reality, we, we are the product of, of, of the process. And we see Abraham... Tried to circumvent the situation, didn't he? Yep. When, when he went, and because he wasn't having the child, uh, because because Sarah couldn't get pregnant, so so they so they give the maid servant to him, and they have Ishmael, and Ishmael was not the promised one, right? It was Isaac who was the promised one, and, and Abraham tried to circumvent that, and we see that 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 because of that, that that Ishmael and Isaac would be warned against each other the whole lives. Abraham. You need to have a little patience. Sometimes God says slow. In James 5, 7 and 8, gives us the perfect picture of this. It says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. But you too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. You know, farmers just can't, can't lay down some magic beans and then turn around and poof, they have the crops. They got to plant their crops. They got to fertilize their crops. They got to water the crops. And they can do it in the springtime so they can have a harvest in the summer. Right? And in the fall. And, and, and James is saying the same way. We need to be patient like that. You know, we need to be patient and stand firm because God is coming. And I think we need to do that in our prayer life. We need to have that patience. To allow God to answer our prayers. Your answer is coming. It just might not be his time. The answer is ready. But maybe you aren't. Amen. And, and so God. God answers our prayers. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says slow. Sometimes he says grow. That's my next one. Sometimes God answers it is grow. Because I believe that we are the biggest barrier to God being able. I, I really do. I, I think we, we pray to God, and then we set out our answers on our own prayers. We, we pray to God, and we say, God, answer this prayer for me, but I'm going to do it myself. Right? right? I mean, I think that's one of the biggest barriers uh, of our prayers is that, is, that, is that we do that. We throw that word but in there. I, I know, God, you're, you're faithful and you're great and you can do everything, but I, I want it done this way. We pray fervently for God to fix something while we continue to commit sin that separates from us from Him. When we continue to do things that, that keep us separated, we want God to fulfill our selfish wants and our desires. We ask God to fix the other person, but we never stop to look within ourselves and ask God to fix us first. And there's times when God answers our prayers dependent upon our growth and our Christian faith. I, I believe if we're going to have an effective prayer life, then we must allow God to reveal areas of our life, of our heart, that's out of sync with Him, Areas of distrust, of unbelief, and sin. Could it be possible that before God can change the issues 
you are praying about, he must change us first. Amen. Have we ever thought about that? That we want God to fix something in our life? But first and foremost, he needs to fix us before he can fix the problem that lies right there in front of us? I mean, look at your list of prayer requests. What do I need to do to be ready to receive your blessing? I believe that's, that's something that we need to ask God. Or how must I grow so that this answered prayer can be so this prayer can be answered? Or, or what do I need to do to prepare for your answer to my prayer? Because sometimes we need to be ready Amen. when God answers that prayer for us. Are you asking God to allow His love to rule your heart? Are, are you asking Him to trust Him with things that you do not understand? Or, or how to be patient? Our request might be right. The timing might be off. But when our lives are wrong, God says, before I grant your request, you must grow. Put that sin away. Change your attitude. Stop that practice. In that pattern, soften your spirit. Repent. Receive forgiveness. Grow. And then I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings you and I have enough of. None of us fully realize how much God wants to answer our prayers, how He longs to change our impossible situations, to touch an untouchable person through us, or to move what seemed to be an immovable mountain. But sometimes we just have to grow before God can do it. The last thing I want us to see is that sometimes God's answer is go. Go. Sometimes God's answer to our prayers involve active obedience. I know people don't want to hear that. That's, that's the truth. To those wanting healing, he might say, take up your bed and walk. God answered prayers, answers our prayer by calling us to be involved. We pray for the lost. God says, go make disciples for all nations. We pray that someone will minister to that young boy in our community and God says, commit yourself to that work and you go minister to them. You know, and I made a prayer. Carlisle Avenue. Then, over 20 years ago, we were losing people right and left in our church. And I'm sitting up here and the pastor prayed about or the pastor was talking about people being involved. I'm like, man, God, you need to, you need to get people in here. And I can remember God's answer that day. It was direct. He put me in my chair. He says, you are going to be that person. You're praying for leaders, Greg? I'm going to make you a leader. I prayed, and I said, God, you open doors, and I'll walk through them. Because, see, sometimes... God tells us we need to go, that we need to step up, that we need to do things. There might be somebody out there who, who, who is sick and might need a meal, and, 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 and he might put on your heart to go and make that meal, but maybe while you're there, he wants you to do their dishes, do their laundry, clean their house, do, do other things for them, because you pray for that sick co-worker, and God, God says, you go and help that sick co-worker. Maybe you prayed for, for, for a, a missionary or somebody else and you were saving money up for something special. God might say, hey, look, you need to give that money to that missionary. I'll give you more money later. You might say that, you might say, God, we need to bring people into this church. And he might say, you go to this neighborhood and you start talking to people about my, about my son. Hearing and accepting God's answers take courage. The courage to go as God commands you to obey. God, even when He answers, does not look exactly, God's answer does not look exactly like your request. What is God calling you to go to? Where, where is He calling you to go? You know, he, he tells us the harvest is great, it is plentiful, but the workers are few. Sometimes your prayers, God answers and says, I want you to go. Take care of that problem. We are his hands. His so to wrap up, are you willing to give him praise when he answers no? Do 
you have the patience to endure when he answers slow? Are you willing to give him praise? Or, or, or are you willing to mature when he answers you to grow? How about the courage to obey when he answers go? Are you willing to embrace God's answer to your prayers even when his answer does not comply with the fine, fine print of your request? Amen. What we need to understand is that God will answer our prayers. He does not always answer our prayers the way we want to, the way, he, the way we want him to answer. We have to have a trust. We have to have a faith to understand that he will answer the way that he wants to. And that's hard. Because sometimes our prayers are for family members. Our, our prayers are for people that we love, that we care about. And God answers in a different way. And we have to be willing to trust that. 